Hi, this is Dr. Cassandra Quaid, and in this lecture we'll be covering safety and efficacy issues associated with herbal products used in the USA. This is um, created for the botanical medicine and health class that I teach at Emory University, and the purpose of this video is only for educational um, outreach to my students. So I'll begin with an explanation of the learning objectives for this lesson. They are to describe some of the major um, safety issues that the herbal supplement industry currently faces. Um, they should be able to discuss some of the ways that these problems can be mitigated and also be able to provide specific examples of herbal, herbal products that have resulted in serious illness or death. And lastly, describe how the FDA handles such cases. Um, another important theme we're going to come back to throughout this lecture is the fact that natural does not always mean safe. Um, it's easy to become confused based on just pure marketing of products. Um, we kind of have this impression of everything natural um, being better than things that are synthetic, which in some, some cases they can be, um, but this is not always the case. In fact, there are some levels of risk associated with these uh, herbal supplements due to the way that they're um, regulated under current um, policy. So before we get into the heart of the lecture, I wanted to mention a few terms that are important that you understand. Um, these will be brought up throughout the remaining parts of the lecture. The first is this idea of adulteration. This is the main focus of the lecture. And adulteration, it's basically um, a term that explains the, space, the debasement of an article. Um, and this could be either deliberate or accidental. So some examples could be substitution with the wrong species of the herb or addition of other synthetic compounds to the herb, and so on. Inferiority, on the other hand, refers to uh, a substandard condition of the product. So this perhaps could be relevant um, for, for herbal products that are harvested at the wrong time or have lower than normal levels of the um, active uh, chemistry because the wrong part of the plant may be collected or um, Perhaps the plant is dying, or there's there's something that's affecting its its normal chemistry. Deterioration is a major issue, and this refers to um, kind of degradation of the crude product. So this could be caused by multiple environmental factors such as light, oxidation, exposure to humidity or moisture, heat, and so on. You may also have deterioration of the chemistry of the product, especially with regards to the um, loss of volatile components, these volatile oils that can come off. Now the term admixture refers to the addition of one article to another. Um, this could be due again to either accident or um, carelessness. An example could be the inclusion of dirt or soil on a root product or an herbal, herbal remedy that comes from roots. Or perhaps the collection of two similar species um, by accident. Um, sophistication is re refers to the deliberate addition of inferior material, and this is really with the intent to defraud the customer or the buyer. Um, if, as we'll learn in, in the rest of the lecture, in many cases the companies that create the dietary supplements that are actually marketed and sold in the U.S. are not the ones that are growing the plants. This is often contracted out to the developing world. And so you always run the risk of, um, of uh, having um, the materials in somehow adulterated to increase the weight or increase the value or price of, the, of their um, bulk product. Um, an example of this could be taking um, ginger powder and diluting it with starch, with cornstarch, or to give, you know, and they may add a little bit of coloring to, to change, a little bit of, of, of food coloring to change the color so it would match more of what ginger looks like. Substitution, on the other hand, is the, the addition of an entirely different um, article in place of what is required. So, for example, um, this could be the use of another plant oil um, as a substitute for olive oil, or it could be the use of um, different types of leaves that may look like the leaves of the herb that you're trying to, to buy, and again, just bulking up and increasing the volume of the product to get a better price, but not actually using the correct herb. 
And this, of course, is associated with many different dangers because of the unique chemistry of plants. You could actually be substituting something that's highly toxic for the intended um, herbal product. Now, phytopharmacovigilance is a new buzz term in the field, and this really refers to the systematic study of the role of kind of herbs in, in, in human pharmacology. So this is again studying how these herbs interact with the body and the pharmacological um, action and relevance of these um, products. Lastly, herb-drug interactions. This term refers to the um, contraindications or kind of bad reactions that can happen when a patient is taking more than one drug. And the key thing here is recognizing that herbal products do represent a drug. These are plant drugs, um, not the same perhaps as what you're getting in a pill form um, from the pharmacy, but what can happen is just as in normal drug-drug interactions, you can also have cross interaction between your herbal products and your other um, pharmaceuticals or even over-the-counter drugs. And we'll provide some examples of that in a bit. Now let's start off with some, some more clear examples of types of adulteration. Um, now the first one I want to discuss is that of substitution with inferior varieties. This again could be either on purpose or it could be accidental. Um, in the end, it's really the customer that suffers, so this is an important issue. Um, here's an example of cassia senna. Now cassia uh, or senna is a stimulant laxative and it has these um, compounds that are commonly marketed even in over-the-counter products um, and also in herbal stores. And what has been found to happen is that sometimes the, um, the plant may be adulterated with related species. So here I have put up some pictures of Cassia angustifolia and Cassia auriculata. And just by glancing at them, you can tell how very difficult it can be to differentiate even between the, um, the live uh, samples, much less you know, a pile of ground up um, bulk sample. Now, some of the, uh, this, this just kind of highlights the issues when you have plants that have morphological resemblance to the um, intended um, crude product. Another example could be the substitution of Japanese ginger or Zingiber nioga with Zingiber officinale or the medicinal ginger um, that's also found at times. Now, what are the dangers of having these cases of mistaken identity? Well, they can be actually quite high, um, especially if it's not, you know, in this case we have two very different species. Um, now, there is a, a popular herb used in traditional Chinese medicine known as Fang Ji, and you can see on the right how the leaves kind of look. What happens is sometimes this can be adulterated with Guang Fang Ji or Aristolochia Fang Ji. And um, for those of you that are familiar with Aristolochia, you know that it contains um, often high levels of Aristolochic acid, which is of course a very potent um, nephrotoxin. Um, it's again does a lot of damage to the kidneys. Um, so you can get renal poisoning by having the wrong plant in your herbal remedy um, for these. Again, rec representing a very significant health uh, risk. Here's another plant that actually impacted the Cuban American and Latin American communities in Miami um, in around 2004, I believe. And this was an accidental substitution with Elysium species. So Elysium is the genus of star anise, and you can see here pictures of what the whole plant um, looks like and the actual um, fruits that are used in these teas. And star anise, the Chinese star anise is something that's used, um, it's, it's well known and used it as a spice in many different cultures. Um, again, in particular in Caribbean and Latin, Latino populations, often use a tea infusion of its fruit as a carminative. 
that basically means it helps to get rid of intestinal gas and kind of gas pains. And it's also used as a sedative. And what's key here is the population that it's used on are infants, in particular infants that suffer from colic. Um, it has a very long history of use and has been commonly regarded as safe and non-toxic. Um, what happened in Miami, however, is that supplies of anise, of star anise, were actually adulterated with the Japanese version of star anise, and this is Elysium anisatum. And again, this is an example in which the two species look quite similar, especially if you're looking just at the fruit, it's almost impossible to, impossible to differentiate them morphologically. So for the customers buying it, it looks just like Chinese star anise, and they had no idea they were buying the wrong species. Um, now, if you look at the phytochemical profile of this, of course, there are differences, um, and there are compounds that are found in the Japanese version that have both neurological and gastrointestinal tox toxicities. And we saw a rise in um, young infants being admitted to the Miami um, ICUs um, for, for infants, the NICUs, during this time because of these horrible toxicities that they've developed as a result of taking the wrong species. So again, this is this the simple substitution of something that looks very similar can have very powerful um, and detrimental effects. Now other types of adulteration, you can have um, artificially manufactured substitutes so an example of this could be the use of artificial um, types of sugars for honey or the use of paraffin wax that's been colored with yellow um, substances that's being substituted for beeswax in different remedies. You can also have substitution with exhausted drugs. And what this means is basically you have plant materials that may be extracted. So you are working with these materials to pull out the valuable chemistry to use in different products. Well, at the end of this extraction process, after you've dried the plants again, they can often look quite similar to the original uh, version of the plant, but in fact, they've already been stripped of all of their phytochemical um, properties. And this is really common, especially in plants that have high volatile oil contents um, that are used in different medicines. Um, some examples can include things like cloves and fennel um, and even ginger or um, cascara sagrada or other, other examples. So basically then if these products are sold back out, you're basically selling something that is pharmacologically inert because the chemistry that is desired from the product has already been removed and used for a different product. Now, other kinds of adulteration could include the addition of worthless or inert substances to the bulk materials that are being sold. Um, so again, this is at the stage of transition from the person that harvests or grows the, 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 the herbal products, selling them to these companies that then create the marketed medicinal, herbal medicinal products. So some examples that have been found are the inclusion of stones basically mixed in with licorice root to bulk up the weight of the product, or even lead shot being mixed with poppy seeds or poppy verisimniform. This is the opium poppy. Um, other examples of substitution could include the use of cheaper substances, cheaper natural substances. So these, this is a case where you can have um, plants that are not actually related by um, within the same genus even, but they may on at glance, especially when they are um, being evaluated in their dry form or even in some cases powdered form, they may look very similar. They may have the same color or shape of the leaf. Some examples could be the substitution of belladonna um, leaves with scopalia or phytolacca which of course all three have very different chemistries and could have very different pharmacological effects and even some um, potential for toxicity if used improperly. Other forms of adulteration could include the use of vegetative matter from the same plant. So in this case, we're talking about the fact that uh, the 
desired chemistry, the desi desired phytochemicals may not reside in the entire plant. Say, for example, they may reside in the leaves, but not the roots. So this would be the sale of the roots or some other part of the plant instead of the leaves where the activity is. Um, um, so, for example, um, sometimes stems can even be cut into short lengths and added um, to different different parts uh, in substitution. Now, the another form of uh, adulteration is the addition of synthetic principles. So this means basically adding some kind of synthetic chemical to the drug or to the herbal uh, crude product. So some examples could be adding citrol to um, oil of lemon, uh, benzyl benzonate to um, bals balsam of Peru. And there are other um, really prominent examples that the FDA has been battling over recent years um, where you find actual substitution of um, known and um, prescription drugs that are added to these um, herbal products. A great example of this is the finding of sildenafil and many kinds of herbal Viagras or sexual enhancement drugs where they in fact have are taking plants and then adding these extra um, synthetic compounds to the drug and in fact it is effective because you're basically giving people um, the synthetic compound. However, there is of course a risk because this is um, a prescription drug that should only be given under the supervision of a physician. Um, another example is this emergence of the legal, and I put that in quotes, um, marijuana um, products that are basically these cannabinoid mimics that we'll talk about and this includes things like K2 and Spice. So let's talk about the herbal Viagra issue. So these are, again, plant products that are being marketed as all natural, but they actually have been um, adulterated with sulfur aldenafil, which is a chemical very similar to sildenafil, which is the active ingredient in Viagra. And the danger here is that this can, of course, interact with prescription drugs like nitrates, including nitroglycerin, and cause dangerously low blood pressure. So if this is being used in the older male population where um, many of them could have the potential for having um, uh, heart conditions or cardiovascular conditions in which they're on prescription drugs to manage these, and if they're taking these quote unquote natural versions of herbal vi Viagra, which are actually substituted with um, pharmaceutical grade Viagra, um, this presents obviously a, a, a serious issue for um, for um, for bad effects to happen. Now, the FDA has found a lot of products that are being marketed as dietary supplements for sexual enhancement over the past several years that again can be harmful because they're being they are actually containing these active FDA approved ingredients. However, the danger here is they're not again being administered under the supervision of a physician. Um, you can just buy these over the counter. And so, any basically, if you see any kind of sexual enhancement products that promise a rapid effect, such as something that works within minutes to hours, or if it's promising something that has long-lasting effects, like 24 to 72 hours, these are usually highly likely to contain ingredients um, from FDA-approved drugs or variations of those ingredients. So they may also go and use synthetic chemistry to do a little tweak to one of the side chains and then um, say, well, it's not sildenafil, it's actually this other closely related version of it, but again, can have very serious effects and side effects for the heart if not um, given under supervision. Now let's talk about spice and K2. This, is a, um, uh, this has been a really um, big issue recently because this has been so heavily marketed in head shops and has really been affecting the young population. So first of all, I want to put this out there. If there are any of you that are watching this that have ever heard of K2 or Spice or you're interested in taking it, please do not. And you'll find out why. It can be very dangerous for you. And this is in no way, in no way similar to what um, the real cannabis um, does to you. Now, 
a little bit of a history about the compounds here. So these are synthetic cannabinoids that bind very tightly with CB1 receptors. Um, they were designed with good intentions. They were actually designed by a chemist at Clemson University, um, John Huffman, who was synthesizing analogs and metabolites of THC, which is, a, of course, the active component of cannabis. Um, this particular compound, JWH18, is one of the analogs that he created. Um, and these sh showed a really high affinity for the CB1 receptor. In fact, it was five times higher than that of THC. And these are found, these receptors are of course found in the brain and spleen tissue. Um, however, we still poorly understand the structural details of the active sites where these, the binding occurs. So what has happened is that these compounds, these analogs, um, have escaped the lab basically and are being used in these herbal incense products. So these are often sold as kind of herbal incense. And the way that they're made is really quite disturbing. Basically, you're taking um, just these random bits of plant material, which in itself poses risks, because we all know that different plants have very specific phytochemistry, and that in itself, if you're taking unknown plants, can create problems for your health. Now. What makes this even more alarming is the fact that they're spraying on these synthetic cannabino cannabinoid mimics onto the plant material. So these are, again, synthetically made compounds being sprayed onto random bits of plant material. So this is not at all a true herbal product. You're just basically trying to work the system to call it an herbal product by using random herbs and spraying on synthetic things. Now, one of the dangers in the way that it's made also, in addition to the fact that it has such tight binding with the CD1 receptors, is that it, the spraying technique is not, um, is not, let's say, adhering to GMP kind of manufacturing um, policies. And what I mean by that is you basically may have uneven spread of the chemicals on the plant material. So you may get a batch that has very high levels of, the, of these compounds um, on the plant material, whereas others would have lower. So if you get a batch where you have a whole lot of the compound, you can have very serious side effects. In fact, some of the side effects include these very disturbing, intense hallucinations and first responders, you know, um, paramedics and people that are responding to cases um, of kind of toxic and poisoning um, cases associated with this find that the patients have really intense hallucinations and um, that are associated with these psychotic episodes. What's also alarming is that there is a very strong dependence associated with the use of these. And um, again, this is probably all related to the way that these tightly bind to that receptor. Um, ER physicians ha across the US have been reporting higher um, levels of admissions connected to the abuse of these um, mimics. Now, a detailed chemical analysis um, are, by the DEA is finding, again, that these are being marketed to the public and the risk is high because of the way that they're made. Some of the ways that they're marketed, the street names of this can include things like Bliss, Black Mamba, Bombay Blue, Fake Weed, Genie, Spice, and Zohai, or also known as K2 as well. Um, these are sold again in head shops, tobacco shops, various re retail outlets, and of course over the internet. And it's being marketed as fake weed, and people think that if they buy this, it's a way of legally purchasing marijuana, which in fact is not anywhere close to being a safe substance. The DEA um, in March of 2011 published a final order um, to place five of these onto the Schedule I um, kind of classification. So the, the substances are being placed onto um, as, as DEA Schedule I compounds, but what's happened is that these kind of rogue chemists that are out there are then using other analogs and then substituting, putting in different versions, you know, making little tweaks to the chemistry and then putting out those products. 
but these should be avoided at all costs. They are not a safe um, product that's out there. The bad thing is that stores have very high incentives to continue to sell these products um, even though they pose such a great danger to the population. And this is because a typical head shop can sell between 8 to 10 grand worth of, um, of these products in a single month. Um, here's um, a clip from an article um, that talked about the use of this and this is from a, um, an owner of a novelty store. It's going big time. It's even surpassing porn and adult toy sales. I mainly sell it because there's been a huge request among my customers. Again, these customers are uninformed and don't understand the risks associated with this, um, this product. Okay, let's shift now into issues with de deterioration of herbal products. So as with any kind of drug, there is a shelf life and this can be influenced by many factors, can include the quality of the storage conditions, the stability of the active principles as well. So some of the environmental conditions that can, that can actually um, strongly impact the, um, the kind of usability or usefulness of these um, crude herbal products include things like light exposure, temperature, humidity, um, exposure to oxygen, and of course presence of pests. Um, often in plant materials you may find the presence of insects, worms, molds, and bacteria which can all um, contribute to the decay of the materials. Now um, you can do some things to help avoid this de degradation um, by for example for light using um, um, light resistant or opaque containers that are covered in a dark space you can control for humidity and moisture um, by sealing the, um, the jars well. Temperature can also, of course, be controlled. Um, for example, you have to be very careful with drugs that contain volatile constituents. Um, um, for example, in the Laniaceae family, petals of rose and chamomile and any kind of um, oils can be lost with an increase in temperature. Um, um, so, rose family, rose, you know, for rose petals, um, asteraceae, for chamomile, and all of your mints and these kind of um, uh, terpenoids and such can be lost. Now, oxidation is a big issue for certain oils, for example, linseed oil, even olive oil, um, that can be um, controlled for as well. Now the presence of living organisms of course can be prevented by um, having close inspection of the materials to drying them properly and um, keeping the moisture levels down to prevent, uh, to kind of deplete the conditions that would be good for growth of molds or bacteria. Now I wanted to give the example of lemon balm to kind of explain how the loss of volatile constituents can um, basically make the herbal product inactive. So lemon balm, if you don't know, is a popular, um, it's from Melissa Fusinalis, and it is used popularly in the treatment of herpes simplex viral outbreaks, and it's also taken orally for insomnia and nervousness. Now what's interesting is that the active constituents responsible, especially for the sedative activity, for treating insomnia and nervousness is in the volatile essential oil content. So if you're using a product that's um, more than six months old um, for these purposes, you're probably not getting the um, activity that you would be expecting because the volatile oils have probably already escaped. Now, as far as herb-drug interactions go, um, we really don't have the statistics in place to understand what the true prevalence is for herb drug interactions. Um, we do know that a lot of people use um, complementary alternative medical practices and kind of herbal products, um, but we don't have a real hold on how many in the patient population actually do use it. The biggest reason for this is the fact that many CAM users don't disclose their practices to their physicians. Um, there have been studies on this that have shown that it's often associated with fear of reprimand, the fear that your physician will somehow 
um, reprimand you or um, scold you for using herbal products or tell you to stop using the products. Patients don't want to hear that. Um, the other problem is that because of the way that our medical and pharmacy schools are set up, there's not a great deal of um, depth given to studying um, herbal medicine in school, so they have very little actual knowledge of it and, and ability to advise patients oftentimes on possible herb-drug interactions because, again, this is just not an area that's being focused on in the education system that they've um, come through. Um, another issue, of course, is because we are lacking a lot of the research um, to understand how um, herbs and, and pharmaceutical drugs may, may interact, or even how different herbs, you know, um, could interact. So taking more than one herbal supplement may actually have contraindications as well. Um, the issue again is is that we just don't have the the science isn't there yet. We need to have more focus on phytopharmacovigilance and the study of herb drug interactions so that we can better advise um, patients that use these. Now some examples of herb drug interactions could be the um, these stimulant laxatives. I like this example because um, they're quite common in the market. You can find over-the-counter products even at your typical pharmacies that contain some herbal um, constituents in their in their um, formulation. Or you may find a lot of just um, of these products in health food stores. And the danger here is that any of these, any kind of um, laxative like this can actually ad ad interfere with the absorption of almost in any intestinally absorbed drug. So if you are have if you're on some sort of drug that is absorbed through the gut, which they commonly are if it's an oral medicine, you're going to interfere with that absorption. Um, now other examples could be um, I like to use this one a lot is the treatment of patients that have clotting disorders. So patients that are on anticoagulant therapy should avoid certain herbal medicines and even certain foods because remember plant foods can also have um, high pharmacological activity. Um, a great example of this could be garlic. So if you are taking a lot of garlic supplements or you just eat a whole lot of garlic in your diet, which is um, known to be good for cardiovascular health, um, this can however have ill effects if you're also taking anticoagulants. Now I wanted to touch also on this idea of how we actually approach herbal medicine in our, in our country because it's quite different from how these medicines have been used for millennia in traditional, um, in traditional practices. So we have these um, medicines that have been used again within very specific sets of traditional knowledge you have healers that are trained throughout their lifetime to use and, and um, apply these herbs to their patients. However, we've then taken some of those and pop, put them and ground them up and put them into a pill and kind of left it up to the consumer to decide what's best for their health based on whatever marketing or advertising is allowable on these bottles. And um, this in itself is really um, kind of inherently unsafe um, for public health. If you take the example of ephedra, so ephedra seneca is in the ephedraceae family. This is also known as ma wang. It's a, an ancient Chinese medicine that has been used for thousands of years in the management of um, respiratory conditions. And it's a very effective treatment for respiratory conditions. It's used as a decongestant and a bronchodilator. So it actually acts by um, constricting some of the capillaries and blood vessels around the nose, reducing swelling for um, people that have congestion. So parts of the plant juice may be squeezed into the nose, for example, in traditional treatments, or a steam bath may be used um, to inhale. Now the constituents of this um, plant include alkaloids, like ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, norephedrine, ephedroxine, and others. It also has catechin derivatives and diterpenes. In traditional Chinese medicine, again, it's been successfully used for asthma, nasal decongestion, hay fever, um, and it's also a central nervous system and a cardiac stimulant. 
Now, the way that we went wrong with this is that the herbal supplement industry took this traditional medicine and saw, wow, this is great as a central nervous system stimulant, so we're going to use this in our weight loss formulations. And it was heavily marketed as a weight loss aid and used in products like Metabolife, uh, Metabolift, Diet Fuel, Stacker 3, Hydroxy Cut, and some of these others in the 90s in particular. Now, what happened though is you had uh, more and more cases that arose of people suffering from serious cardiac events as a result of taking these supplements. Now you have to look at the patient population as well. These are people that may have had eating disorders or other kind of health um, health conditions um, or anorexia and so on that could have exacerbated these effects. Um, the, the long, to make a long story short, the FDA eventually banned its use in, in herbal products. What's important to know is that it's also, um, these products can be pulled from other plants, not just ephedra uh, seneca, but the ephedra alkaloids in general were um, kind of banned. Now, to give you um, some examples um, of how this applies to policy and regulation, I want to explain a little bit about the FDA, um, the FDA's uh, Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act that was passed, the DSHEA Act passed in 1994. So under this act, the FDA bears the burden of proof to show the di that a dietary supplement presents a significant or unreasonable risk to prevent it from being marketed. Um, however, in contrast, if you have drugs that have a similar pharmacological property to ephedra, the manufacturers are the ones that bear the burden of proof of showing the drug is safe before it can be marketed. So there's real, really no burden of proof on the manufacturers of these under the DCA Act to show, to prove that they are safe as would be expected in a typical single compound kind of drug that goes through FDA approval. Now, the, again, the active principle in ephedra is um, this, these ephedra alkalo alkaloids like ephedrine, and it has these adrenaline-like stimulant uh, effects on the heart. And what, what they found was that you had cases, again, of, uh, that showed that ephedra can actually also raise blood pressure and cause stress in the circulatory systems. And this was what was conclusively linked to, to significant and substantial adverse health effects like heart problems and strokes and people that actually died from, these, um, from the use of this product. Now, the regulatory policy of the herbal industry is quite light under the DSHEA Act. Again, the burden of proof is on the FDA, it's not on the manufacturers. Um, and it leaves the consumer population vulnerable to products that can be um, adulterated, that may have um, some ill health effects. So even though a product like ephedra was used safely in traditional Chinese medicine for thousands of years, does not, this does not mean that that plant can then safely be used in the context of a dietary supplement, especially if it's being used for a completely different purpose than the original Chinese medical application, right? Because remember, it was being added as nose drops to treat um, respiratory um, kind of inflammation and uh, congestive uh, issues. Now, there are ways that we can control for adulterants in our herbal um, products, and these are undertaken by many of the um, leading herbal companies, and they can look for marker compounds. So another problem that complicates the whole process is that in many cases, we still don't have the science there to understand how these products work. So we don't always have the active ingredient or more commonly ingredients because these often have a synergistic effect and um, we don't always know what to look for but they can look for marker compounds or these types of compounds that are typically found in these samples. 
We can also look at voucher specimens. So voucher specimens, again, are a copy of the plant. It's basically collected and pressed for storage in an herbarium, and it serves as a physical record of that plant. So one way that we can also help to improve um, uh, the herbal, herbal products being bought could be by, again, requiring matching voucher specimens with each bulk sample that's, that's sold. So in conclusion, I want to just, again, reiterate that natural does not always equal safe. Uh, the goal of this talk is, of course, not to discourage you from using herbal supplements or herbal medicine in general, but just to be aware and cognizant of some of the risks and to look out for yourself. Um, some important things to keep in mind, again, are to think about the context of this herbal remedy. Is it being marketed for use in the same way that's been safely used for millennia? Or is this some new use of the plant that has not really been tested? Is the way that's being prepared really representative of its long-standing traditional treatment? In many cases, these are um, aqueous or water, um, water extractions of plants that are used in, in a lot of traditional medicines. Does this actually translate to grinding up a plant, checking for its uh, uh, phytochemical markers, and popping it into a pill? Does that actually translate well to how it's been used successfully for millennia? I would argue no, um, but that's again my opinion. And um, again, the point here is just to become aware of what um, is out there. If you do use herbal products and you're using other prescribed or, or even over-the-counter drugs, or if you're using multiple herbal products, become informed. You also need to inform your physician and your pharmacist of these practices. Um, don't be fearful of explaining to them what your, what your health practices are. As a patient, you should be empowered to let them know what you're doing, to get their advice. But again, the ultimate decision, of course, lies with you and these practices. But you need to let them know about it. Um, and you should also investigate the potential for herb drug interactions yourself. Um, if you think that there could be a potential for risk, ask again the medical professionals or look at what resources you have available to see if um, there's any potential for risk. And as a last resort, you know, the, you can always stop using the product until you know whether or not you have a risk for um, potential um, uh, contraindications. Here are the references that, um, some of the references used in this talk. And I thank you for your attention. And that's all. Thanks.